Today on The Crit House, Nan Golden. Nan Golden is one of her generation's most important and influential artists. She has revolutionized the art of photography through her profoundly personal portraiture. Nan Golden was born in 1953 in Washington, D.C. and grew up outside of Boston. She started creating photographs in the early 1970s while studying at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. Her early work focused on the gay, lesbian, and transgender communities in Boston and New York City. In the 1980s, Golden gained recognition for her seminal series, The Ballad of Sexual Dependency, which chronicled the lives of her friends and lovers in New York City. Golden's work is characterized by its rawness and emotional intensity. She often explores themes of love and sexuality and addiction, much of which draws from her own experiences. Her images are intimate and personal, capturing moments of vulnerability and tenderness. In recent years, Nan Golden has been a vocal activist against the Sackler family, who owns Purdue Pharma, the pharmaceutical company responsible for marketing and distributing OxyContin. Golden herself struggled with addiction to OxyContin. In 2017, Golden founded the group Pain, Prescription Addiction Intervention Now, to protest the Sackler family's role in the opioid crisis. The group organized protests and die-ins at museums and galleries that received donations from the Sackler family, calling for them to refuse Sackler funding and remove the Sackler family name from their institutions. This effort was documented in the Oscar-nominated film All the Beauty and the Bloodshed. Today, Golden lives and works in New York City. She continues to influence contemporary photography and art. And today, on the Crit House Masters, we discuss the work of Nan Golden. <laughs> and we're here today on the Crit House with Lisa Kessler yeah. and Stella Johnson to talk about the amazing Nan Golden, one of uh, one of the all-time great photographers. Lisa Kessler is a longtime documentary uh, of uh, projects photographer, and her projects include an exploration into the idea of the color pink in America and a firsthand account of the revelation of the crimes of sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. And she now teaches documentary photography at Endicott College. And Lisa, it's uh, it's great to have you here on the Crit House. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. And once again, we have one of my favorites, Stella Johnson here. She is a photographer. She's an educator. She is a core Fulbright scholar. She has a couple of monographs out there, Al Sol and Zoe. Did I pronounce that right? No, but that's okay. <laughs> how, it's called how is, Zoe. I call Zoe. it Zoe, but other people say Zoe, so you're you're in good you know you're in good company either. I way. wasn't even I wasn't even close. She <laughs> was uh, twice a Photo Lucida finalist, and she teaches wildly popular workshops worldwide. She's done it in Boston, in New York, Maine, Florida, California. She's right now in Mexico. She's been in Colombia, Cuba, and Greece, and Israel. And uh, those uh, those uh, workshops, I am told because I have spoken with people who have taken them are amazing. So Stella, it's great to have you with us as well. Thank you. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. Lisa, let's let's start with you. In your in your view, Nan Golden, what what is it that makes her a great photographer? Well, um, I think that what makes a photographer stand out and have their work last over time is when they really break away from the norms of how the medium is used mm. and strike out and on their own path. And I mean, I should begin by saying it's very humbling to talk about, first of all, a living photographer. <laughs> And, you know, if you really dig into her life and her work, it's, it is very, um, it's, it's very intense in a lot of ways, emotionally and historically that, you know, we'll go through. But I did like the idea of starting by looking at her photograph from 1973 called Picnic on the Esplanade. Um, and when I first saw this photograph, it reminded me 
of a photograph by Henri Cartier-Bresson, who was probably the photographer who, when I first saw his pictures and the incredible formal elegance of them, I, you know, it was his work that made me think, oh, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so when I saw her, her photograph, Picnic on the Esplanade, I immediately thought of his photograph, his picnic photograph. And I think when you compare these two photographs, it, it, it explains some of what makes her uh, a standout photographer who really went off on her, on her own. And like the first thing you'll notice in this photograph, first of all, they're all having fun and they are, they are facing the camera. She is part of this group. These are her friends. In fact, she, she's so much a part of the group. You can see on the right hand side, that piece of cake on the plate and that camera bag and the pack of cigarettes, that's her. Yeah. That's gotta be her stuff. Yes. And she just jumped up to take the picture of this world of friends that she had in Boston, this life that she was creating for herself. And there's, there is, you know, there are formal, formal qualities to the photograph, right? You have the receipt, the diagonal line in the background, the, the horizon essentially is a diagonal line that takes your eye through the picture. It's a kind of peak moment, everyone's laughing, but in general, it's, it's a little loose and it's also in color. And I don't know if this is a great reproduction of it or not, because a lot of her work was very, very saturated. But if you go back and look at Cartier-Bresson's photograph of the picnic uh, on the banks of the Marne, which I think was 1938. So whatever the math is between those, you know, 40 years earlier, he, probably doesn't know these people. He's okay. photographing them from, from behind. He is not part of this. He is looking at it. Mm -hmm. And it's a perfect com composition. The man in the foreground on the left is pouring wine. The wine bottle is perfectly in. You know, there's no edges cut off of people's heads or hands or even the circle of the plate on the right. You know, it's all perfectly right there but he's looking at it he's not of it and for me that's the most important it's one of the most important things about her work is that she figured out a way to make her work be her life you know there there's no separation for her and that is a dramatic change from the kind of work that you know, my generation was raised on, which was much more, the camera is for looking out at the world, at other people. I can't think of anybody who shoots in a, or captures or creates photographs in a more personal way. And maybe that maybe there are some, but she's just, she, she does that in a brilliant way. Stella, what, what are your thoughts, just sort of in terms of like where she stands is, but like what's, what makes her great for you? Well, it's the same thing. She's photographing inward, right? But she's a, she she was a rebel. You know? She um, when when I understand now after I've been um, researching, this picture reminds me exactly of um, my years in San Francisco at the San Francisco Art Institute, paralleled her years in Boston, and that's what the scene looked like. And you know, people did take those pictures, but they didn't take it one step further and then put them in slideshows uh, and show them to everybody like that, okay? And so that's part of where she's different, but she is really, she's all about her relationships, the relationships. And I, I honestly believe it goes back to her sister, Barbara, and losing her sister at such a young age. And so, so violently, tragically, so, and Nan never wants to forget her friends. Look at that beautiful self-portrait. Oh my God, I mean, stunning. The whole room is blue and yet the sun illuminates her in the corner of the frame, beautiful. So, you know, part of me was looking at her pictures thinking, well, they're sloppy. This is not sloppy. This is really well-crafted. 
So she had a yin and a yang. She did whatever she wanted to do. She, you know, we had rules to follow. Everything had to be in the frame, foreground, middle ground, background. She maybe knew all those rules, but she broke them. And I'm more power to her. You know, she. It, this is really different work than Lisa and I were trained on, at least. You know. Well, so what is it? What is it that about these images that allowed her to break those rules? Is it is it that she portrayed the personal so intimately? Or yes, uh, she. Um, her friends were like, "Yeah, you know, I mean, nobody, nobody said no, right." And she was taking pictures of her friends having sex. And that's when she said she had to take pictures of herself having sex because she couldn't do it just of her friends. That would be too much of being a voyeur, right? Yeah, so. I think I, I, I heard a story that she told at one point that she was doing one of the slideshows at one point and one of yeah. her friends was upset yeah. that uh, she was in the slideshow in an intimate situation. And she pulled out, that's where she said she needed to yeah. To yeah. take her, her images of herself doing these things she did yeah and she does you know. yeah and i also think that um you know i i think that she was very clear on the purpose of photography for herself and you know probably the first purpose was it gave her a voice i think that after the suicide of her sister I mean, she was only 11 years old and um, she has said that, you know, several years later when she finally picked up a camera, it gave her a voice. I, I think that she didn't speak for several years. I think, you know, I think it's a common thing that happens with people who have dealt with a terrible uh, trauma, mm -hmm. but she believed very strongly. She understood from what she knew of her sister's suffering in the hands of just the very repressive norms of uh, society at that time. It would have been the early 60s, I suppose, right? Um, that, the, that she felt that society kept the wrong thing secret. Yeah. And that's a very, to me, that's a really powerful thing. And like when I look at her photographs, I just see a very clear um, liberation of there's nothing about my life and my friends that like the things that you in the world think are wrong or should be hidden. No, those are the things that need to not be secrets because they're true and they're beautiful. And I think that spirit that she brought to her relationships and, and, and therefore to her photography that like, no, this is what we are. This is who I am. This is who you are. Just that real directness. And then you see it even in the pictures of her parents, you know, yeah. that's, that's, I think what makes the pictures feel so powerful because she's just, she knows exactly that. It, this is real, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, it sounds so cliche no... to say it's real, but. Well, that's not posed, you know? I mean, that's a real loving live moment, you know, that she caught of her parents. Mm -hmm. I, you know, right. I feel like, and that carries over into everything that she did, you know? Um, she had no fear, it feels like. She wanted to live, you know, in the Lower East Side. She didn't have any money. She did what she had to do. She broke all the rules. She broke all the visual rules. She broke all the lifestyle rules. She survived two um, um, addictions, two, se you know, separate addictions uh, to drugs, and she survived them. And she's here today to talk about it and to go even further and defend other people who are you know, were subjected to drugs and addiction. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, I have to say when you, when um, you suggested that we talk about Nan Gold and I, I knew um, of the work, um, not, not intimately. I had, I had never studied um, the work very closely, but I started to realize after we looked at, or after I was looking at the images, um, 
how like my background, I think put up a barrier for me, or at least I put up a barrier to these images that didn't allow me when I first saw them to appreciate them for what they are. And I'm embarrassed about that. I mean, I, so I'm a, I'm a old white cis male. I grew up in the Midwest um, where, um, where this sort of culture is at the time was, was not accepted. And I think I carry the baggage of that background and it made it hard for me when I first saw these images to appreciate them. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying that to sort of purge myself of that, uh, of that um, challenge that I had with it, because these images are so um, touching in so many ways that I, I mean, it's like, uh, uh, they're just lovely. Um, and I think I overuse that phrase, but, uh, but, uh, and I'm not going with the question, but I, th for, for me as a, as again, the person that, where I come from, I, I think that I had blinders on. And I wonder if, if there are, if you, if you think that that has affected her, um, career path as a photographer to the positive or the negative. I don't think she gives a shit. Probably not. No, I think that's right. I think that's a, I think that's hundred percent right. That's right. Yes. I see that's the thing that I admire about her she does not care I mean listen after losing your sister when you're 11 years old the sister was 18 after a violent suicide like that where do you go from there <laughs> you know I was following the rules of the game uh and she she did whatever she felt she needed to do to feel good to feel whole to you know to feel at one whatever that was. And it was a lot of alcohol and drugs that she had to, you know, numb herself. I get that, you know? And of all, so uh, I have, there aren't a lot of criticisms of her work, but that's, that's the one that I will hear every once in a while that it, it, it that you'll see somebody who says that that glorifies the use of drugs. I don't, I don't see that. Um, at least not in the, in the images that I've seen. Um, but, but she talks about it and she yes. writes, she's, oh, a scene. she's all over the internet. So she talks about it. And I had a student, I have to say, who was doing a lot of drugs and alcohol and decided that Nan Golden was the only photographer for her. And I was worried that she was going to use Nan Golden's use of drugs and alcohol to continue doing, uh, doing way too many drugs and alcohol herself. Finally, yeah. she did dry out. So it was okay. But I had that same concern, you know, that uh, this one young woman, not all of them, obviously, but if you're inclined to be drinking, she, but she also said the reason why she loved Nan Golden's pictures is because those people in those pictures did not look like the um, middle-class white people that she grew up with and that she was supposed to be like, okay? They look different because they are different and she felt different, and um, she could relate to these other outsiders, if you will. Yeah. You know, um, and it wasn't so much about the drugs and alcohol, um, but it was my mistake thinking that she preferred the subjects because of their outsider um, label, that they weren't in, you know, part of the mainstream. Let's say. So, Lisa, you had included this batch of images in the some that you've sent to me, um, and I was wondering how uh, this is in there. These aren't all her images, right? Or are they? You know, I think they are, and I I I put them in just because I I I had I was not familiar with them until I came across them, and I'm trying to remember now what they're from they're from an exhibit somewhere but they relate to this idea that she's always interested in which is you know the idea of, of film and um images being used together in a narrative way yeah. and i think she did a lot of experimentation with grids and different sequencing so yeah. you know i don't know the specifics of this story here i mean we can guess about it but uh, I don't I don't know the specifics of this one, okay. but it's it's part of her um, 
always looking to create and recreate narratives from her archive of images. And it's what you alluded to earlier with the slideshows, you know, when she started the slideshows, she was doing it just for her friends. And they, like you said, they would um, crowdsource the pictures, you know, they would be all excited, you know, each person when they saw their photograph or they would say, no, that one's not good, don't use it. And she would keep changing it and changing the slideshow and re-editing it. And it was a major ordeal to continue re-editing it. She did it for every show, she re-edited it, um, changed the music. And she showed, I don't know, I read somewhere that she showed like 700, 800 images yes. in a 45 yeah. minute slideshow. Yeah. Eventually it coalesced into something that was um, installed at the Whitney Biennial, I guess, in. I don't remember what year that was. Mid and then it was in 86, it was made into um, the Aperture book, you know, went down to a hundred and something images. Um, but the, those, and now she just recently, there's an exhibit that is been at the a Modern Art Museum in Stockholm, and it's going to be traveling around Europe. And it's th there's no still images it's like seven different slide rooms of slideshows right. of all different slideshows so you know that's what she's interested in is telling different stories depending on how she's feeling and what she's thinking about and the connection she's making between things so the grids were part of that i don't okay. remember exactly what the application was but the grids were part of it so well, you, we we touched a little bit on this the slideshows. Um, I'm not I'm not as uh, educated in photography as the two of you are. I don't know of anybody else who who did that with slideshows. I'm sure somebody people did, um, but it it was a really interesting concept to me. Not only from the viewer's standpoint of coming to see images with uh, with music in in a in a social environment, whether it's either in a club or at a party or whatever it is. Um, because it takes on it takes on a, a an air of theater and is almost like a movie or a comedy show at the same time. Um, but the, what what I was thinking about, and we talked about this a little bit before we started, was just in the process of coming up with a story, you get immediate response from the people you're showing your images to. You hear their laughter or their groans or that you get a reaction from it, and it's. It's it's like it's like the first crowdsourcing editing tool. Um, you know, you have you get that feedback immediately, and you know how next time not to tell the story because or or how to tell the story because of that feedback you get. I mean, that seems like it seems like a great way to show the images, but a great way to learn how your images are being received as well. Is that is that right? Am I on with that? Yeah, I think so, and I think the the color of the images was so important, and the music. The music added so much, and it was such diverse music. You know, I can't from what Lou Reed to Frank Sinatra to whoever. You know, never she she has a, you know depth and breadth about music, and she used it. And uh, I think it was like very powerful. And she says she's always she wasn't always that interested in photography. She preferred film, and this was her way. I think of having uh, having the photographs be moving and have music. I mean, actually, you know, I I don't remember when she used the pictures too to remember. And I don't remember for my years in San Francisco, people did that. But I I would say no. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah, I mean, I, my thought about that is that the, the main reference to the slideshow is the reference to family. I mean, this slideshow mm -hmm. was, you know, when when the Kodak came up with the carousel. I mean, you all remember the Mad Men episode yeah. when they gave, you know, uh, the main character gives his pitch to the uh, the Kodak people about what the carousel. You know, they, they think it's going to be called the wheel, and he's like, "No, it's the carousel. 
it's it goes round and round and it has that feeling of nostalgia that takes you back to those warm feelings of your childhood mm -hmm. and i think that there's something about like sitting in a darkened theater and these images kind of clicking through is and the music i mean it must have been really very powerful experience to just be there in this whole um experience but the other thing i wanted to say is that the idea of presenting your work to the subjects first is something that you know some photographers have been doing for a long time including stella who well i'm gonna let you speak for yourself but um you know showing the work to your subjects first when you're repeatedly working with a community and you're returning is, mm -hmm. is a pretty common thing. And I think it's what distinguishes a committed photographer from um, a tourist passing through. Yeah, I mean, for me, anyway, it's a, it's a matter of respect, you know, and I don't want to ever exhibit anything that will um, hurt somebody. That's not my goal. And I do see more and more what I what I was doing as a collaboration, even though, yeah, I do. And I think you can see this is very collaborative and performative also. No, it's not strictly documentary. I mean, look at that face. Oh my God, that's the other thing we have to talk about. Yeah. I think the courage that it took for her to show how she was beat up and that it's the other image, but this one too is just d devastating, devastating. And that she had the courage to do that. She had courage, you yes. know. She had courage. Yes. And, ex excuse me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I think. Well, let me tell you something. Forty years ago, nobody was talking about um, assault against women the way we are talking about the uh, Sacklers today. It's you know, I, I think it was it took a tremendous amount of courage also to talk about the to go after the Sacklers, you know, at great risk to her career. But 40 years ago, nobody was talking about that. Everybody thought um, even if you had cancer, you, it had to be swept under the rug and mental illness. Nobody talked about mental illness ever. Cancer, well, any of those. Yes. Well, let's 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 talk about the Sacklers. And let's talk okay. about her, well, what she did with the Sacklers, because we've you, we, we, we've heard the word courage here a, a, a number of times for for very good reason. Um, and I know the intro sort of mentioned it. I, um, for those who don't know, she had a uh, formed a group pain. They took on the the Sackler family, which owned Purdue Pharma, and which was were huge donors to art museums and to the art world. Um, and managed to get museums to, over a period of time, after demonstrations around the world, to get um, those museums to refuse the funding and take the Sackler name off of um, their buildings and off of their galleries. Yes. That's that's a phenomenal achievement for a and photographer. She did it at, at the risk of her career, she asked somebody and she said, listen, could this destroy my career? And they're like, yes, absolutely. This, this could destroy your career. I mean, there was no reason that it wouldn't, honestly. These people were such oligarchs and incredibly greedy. You know, that was the thing that was the ugliest part. They knew that these were, uh, OxyContin was a highly, um, uh, what do you call it? Addictive, Addictive. drug, yeah. And um, the, Mortimer just was like chuckling all the way to the bank. He's dead now, unfortunately, so we can't go after him. But you know the point is, it was just so ugly, and she she stood up. She has stood up for all these people who lost their lives, and has really you know has shamed the Sacklers. Like they have had to flee the country, a lot of them. Good, good riddance. Well, I mean, well, really. you know the, the the thing that is, um, I mean, it, it, uh, an amazing achievement for her to accomplish it. But but she was not only going against the Sacklers; she was taking on the most powerful museums yes that's true in the world you know and, and i mean I, and i haven't heard much about like the pushback from the museums or what the reaction on the museum side but that's her bread and butter that's where you know those are the people who are buying her artwork those are the people who will 
who will um, keep her name in the public eye for throughout history. And I was just going to say, I think that's where what Stella says is true, that 40 years ago, you know, you it wouldn't have worked. But today there's a deeper understanding of the systemic problems that affect individuals. And the reason that we can talk about mental illness and addiction and gender identity and all these things is because we've decided that it's, you know, they're not moral issues. It's not about blaming the individual, that there are structural issues. And this is a perfect example of that, where it's the, the system, you know, the dark money mm -hmm. uh, that was essentially just killing people and the, and the museums were addicted to the money. And yeah. you know, today, you know, it, it worked, you know, with her, their perseverance, it's been really an impressive crusade. And, you know, for me, part of what's so powerful about it is she lived through the AIDS period and watched her friends and loved ones die one after the other after the other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, watched a whole generation of her peers just die without, you know, the government or society really giving much of a crap. And I think, you know, having been through that gave her the courage to just take this risk. And it's like, no, we can't have a whole other generations just being decimated by, you know, in this case, greed. In that case, you know, just this horrible ignorance and homophobia. Um, homophobia. Yeah. Uh, well, and, you know, Fauci was on the forefront of um, getting the AIDS drugs. So, and he came took back. And... Took him a while to get it, though. <laughs> Well, true, but you yeah, know, but he did. Yeah. He did. So, well, the the achievement. Um, I, I and again, I'm not. I have not spent my life steeped in either the art art world or the photography world. But I I'm not familiar with any kind of an achievement that has moved the both the political world, mm. billionaires and the oligarchs, um, as well as the uh, the artistic world in the same way that this campaign did. So uh, for, for that alone, she will be remembered, um, not even talking about the photography, which she will be re re remembered for as well. Lisa, can you maybe talk like, I mean, if you're, if, you're te if you're telling a learning photographer, a young photographer, this is why these images are great from a technique standpoint, like how are, how are they generated? Well, actually, I was going to answer a different question, which is, <laughs> Go say ahead. That, what you started to say earlier. I think that for young people, the snapshot aesthetic, which is, you know, a way that you could define some of Nan Golden's work, mm -hmm. not all of it, because a lot of it, like this photograph, you know, all of this, the self-portraits, that picture of, you know, Brian and Nan on the bed, they are exquisitely composed. You know, she is framing them very, very carefully and making just these beautiful, spectacular images. You know, she set this up presumably on a tripod. She's got the photograph of Brian on the wall looking out at us. She's looking at him with this, you know, I don't even know how to describe that look on her face. It's not exactly longing. It's not exactly fear. It's something in between there. And he's locking off smoking, you know, looking off into the sun. And so there's this interesting triangle that she's set up of, you know, who's looking at whom. And, you know, and I think the whole issue of her idea about relationships and intimacy and, you know, that conflict between the desire to be coupled and to be with someone and to be in a sexual relationship and also the desire to be autonomous and be your own person and not be dependent in any way, you know, is the struggle that she has described as the reason, you know, that is the story behind the ballad. 
but um, I got myself off track a little bit. Um, no, it was uh, a great, it was a great tangent to go on to. I appreciate that. I mean, and I'm glad you came, came to this image because this is, I mean, many of her images stay with me um, when I'm not looking at her. I think of this image um, and her look um, repeatedly, um, you know, and I, 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 you know, I sort of know the triangle you're talking about and how that helps the image, but just that, um, that look in her eye, that giant question mark that you see in, uh, in her glance at him, that's a chilling image for me since, yeah. I mean, meaning, meaning it says it gives me goosebumps. Yeah. But, um, what I was going to say is that for young people, the looseness, not not of this photo, not of her very structurally strong images, with which there are many, but some, of, you know, this is still a strong image, but some of them are just very loose, like, I don't know, maybe the next one, you know, it's a little snapshotty, mm. These are beautiful images, but some of them are just more straightforward snapshots. For young people, that's normal. Yeah. That is what photography is. They're you know, for us, when we were growing up, snapshots were, were what you did in the family. Right. Color pictures was what you did in the family. Art was black and white. So, you know, the idea that what makes someone stand out is when they veer away from whatever the norm is in their field at the time. But those norms are all broken. You know, color photography is completely accepted now for decades. It wasn't when she no. started making this work. You know, working candidly like this um, with people you knew wasn't, you know, it wasn't considered art. It is no. today. So yeah. for young people, you know, the, the full body of her work, you know, in terms of technique, isn't the thing that is different. I think that what's powerful, and I think this is what Stella was alluding to before, what's powerful is the, just the, the feeling of authenticity of the relationships with the people. That, you know, when the, a student goes out and photographs their friends at parties, the pictures may be great, but okay, are you gonna do it over time? Right. Are you going to do it in the middle of the night and and first thing in the morning and in the middle of the party? Like the 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 wholeheartedness with which she threw herself into her life and therefore her photography, you know, that's the thing that's powerful, not the technique of her pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems like there you 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 said it before about her life being her work or something like that, but there's really no separation between the two. It seems like. Right. You know, the, the, the people who are the closest to her, and I've heard her say that, you know, her friends are her family. Yes. Um, there's, the, they, they are all players in, in her art. Sorry, I'm distracted by the images. They're just... <laughs> it's so stunning. I know, we are too. Yeah. Stella, let's um, give us your, give us your, fi just some, a final thought on what your where do where does where does nan golden live in the in the pantheon of the great artists that we have and and not only now but like where does she where does she live as time passes on um it, does it does she stay as one of the greats you know what is or is that too big of a question i, I don't no, even know no but you know i mean I have to say, because she's a woman, you know, it's 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 extraordinary that she has such uh, fame, and her works are collected by all of the major institutions in the world. Okay, just as a woman, now, you know, um, and she was rejected year after year after year. She would um, bring her photographs to galleries, and people would tell her, no, 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 no. The male photographers would tell her, no, this is sloppy. This is no good. She's, she was photographing inward, not outward. You know, the camera was going outward, not inward. And um, I just, uh, I think she's up there with one of the greats because she 
she broke all the rules. I call it that because she did. And, but, and she made her own rules and she still does. And, you know, and this, this is her character and this is who she is. You can't change that. And so in the pantheon of uh, great photographers, she's right up there. I mean, whoever you think is great, she's right next to them. Okay. Uh, I think. I can't, I can't disagree. And um, I, I greatly appreciate the two of you sort of coming up with, uh, with, with her as someone to discuss. It was, it has, it has enriched me and has helped me. Um, Lisa Kessler, um, your, your thoughts on where, where Stella Johnson lives in that pantheon and Stella any final Johnson. thoughts you have. Oh, <laughs> good, yeah. <laughs> we'll do that show we'll do that show next yeah, time another day. <laughs> where does nan uh, sit in that uh in that world well i think for a lot of people when they you know look back you know today from the vantage point of 2023 and you look at how she was engaged with questions of gender identity mm. and sexual identity and loss, you know, the, the grief and the loss of watching your peers die from a mysterious disease, which I think resonates so much with us today yeah. um, during the pandemic and, you know, a million Americans dead. I don't know how many people worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, her her ability to have continued to look and photograph and be herself through the ups and downs of her own history and the history of society is, um, you know, it's like she's created a forever history for us to all feel by by her photographing the life she was leading, you know, by photographing the world she was in, the family she created. Um, and that's, you know, like that's what we thought we were doing as documentary photographers was telling stories and documenting history. Well, she did it in a bold way. Yep. You know, that was, this is her world and this is her history. And and now we can see it's it's a history of all of us. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's Our that side. actually that is very well put, and I think that's a great way to uh, to wrap things up. This is a it is a a document for all of us, um, and thank you for saying that. Um, so uh, I thank uh, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you uh, recommending um, talking about Nan. I I know I learned a lot. I think it opened me up to a lot of photographic ideas um, that I had not um, thought enough about. Um, and hope to integrate into my work. So thank you for, for doing that and your discussion here tonight. Um, for everybody who's watching, we uh, if you are interested, we are going to link out to a couple of videos that uh, Lisa and Stella are have been in. Um, there is a Lisa Kessler artist talk with the Howard Yazerski Gallery that we'll take a look at. You can take a look at that video here and a like a conversation learning to see with Stella Johnson as well. Um, Lisa, Stella, thank you for joining us and thank you all for joining the Crit House. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff.